Hey everybody, what's up and welcome to another episode of Design Blind Date. This week we're having Matt, also known as MDS, on the show. This is a person who I've been looking at for years, wanted to really sit down for a talk with him and this talk was amazing. We could have gone on for hours, but eventually I had to go pick up our kids, which is ironic because this is a lot of what we discussed about how he managed to build a successful design practice, doing all sides, all kinds of side projects and, and amazing stuff as, as other income besides running his design shop while having four kids. This is incredible. I'm sure that even if you don't have kids, you're gonna enjoy this conversation with this amazing amazing, amazing designer. Enjoy it. Hey man. Hey Matt. Thanks so much for, for coming on the show. What's up, man? Absolutely, man. Everything is up. I've, I've got so much going on these days. It's kind of crazy. I can imagine. I can imagine. Like, so uh, like a little bit of context, like I know you for years uh, and we even got to chat a little bit on the Epic Currents, but never really kind of sat down for a real conversation. So I'm super excited about this. Honestly, I got so much stuff to talk to you about. I don't think we're going to be able to talk about everything in an hour. Um, I, I <laughs> well, you know what? If we need to go a little long, that's fine with me. All right. Awesome. So there's, there's a bunch of stuff I want to cover. I want to, I want to hear about how you got started and, and build your studio. I want to talk about your upcoming courses and the courses that you've done in the, in the, in the past, but I want to actually get started um, talking about family. You've got like a beautiful family, your father for f well, four kids, right? Um, yeah, that's right. Which is kind of like two steps ahead of me. I don't even know if I'll ever take those two, two extra steps, but, uh, that's incredible. And like, I know how tough it is just having two kids. So how do you handle like running all these craziness, doing all these side projects, running your studio, having like being with your family? How does that work out for you? Yeah. I mean, you know, when you say it all like that, it sounds crazy. It's like, how would I, when you say that, it's like, I don't know, like, geez, I just make it happen, I guess. Um, there's to me, I feel like, one of the things that I realized, even when we had our first child, uh, for whatever reason, I definitely didn't feel prepared to do it. I never felt ready. And even when we decided we were ready, we later decided we were not ready, but then it was too late. It was like, oh, I guess we're having a baby. And, and so even going like birthing classes to everything just felt like one more little baby step. Okay. I can handle going to a class. I can handle packing a bag to go to the hospital. I can handle, you know, and I think just overall, just breaking it down into the smallest possible next step is really, but you um, were, did you had your own business, like running your studio independently? So actually when, when I, when I, when we first started having kids, I was, um, I've actually never had a full-time job, okay. which is kind of weird. But when, when we had our first, uh, when we had our first kid, it was kind of like, um, I was working kind of full-time for a guy, like for one entrepreneur, but I was a contractor. So I was working like around 30 to 40 hours a week and it was kind of like a full-time job. I was just too naive to know any better. Yeah. You know, I had a hair, hair had a, I was like, I had asked there, but I was a contractor and I'm, you know, thankfully my wife worked for an accounting firm and I was aware of taxes before it was too late. <laughs> um, but I, when we had our second kid, I think my, my quasi full-time contract was kind of, uh, getting depleted or kind of, it was kind of going away. Like the business was very, uh, volatile. And at that point I was, I, was, I started contracting for larger agencies, making better money, um, like per hour, like way better than my my kind of in-house job, and so that was that was enough for us to kind of be like, okay, we can at least figure this out. And I think at one point, my wife was an employee of my company, so we could qualify for group health insurance. Okay, um, because she didn't she didn't have. Um, uh, maternity insurance mm. when we got pregnant with our second. We were like, oh my gosh. And and there's been all these like, oh my gosh moments. Um, but you know, you figure it out along the way. And I think that's kind of how 
it's been even with like, you know, quote unquote running a business or building a studio and courses and side projects, you know, it, I don't feel like I'm doing anything magical. I'm just doing regular stuff throughout the day. And but you I'm know, just kind of, I know that like being a father has <laughs> lots of responsibilities and tasks and obligations and like, even like the practical things, like, were you working from home? Were you, did you always have mm -hmm. this like amazing space that you're working on right now? Yeah. So I worked from my bedroom for many years when I was, and actually, I guess that's, that's an interesting thing to talk about because even when I was working full time, quote unquote, for this other guy, I was doing contract work from like 10 PM to 2 AM at, at the dining room table. You know, and I did that for years. So nobody ever saw me do that because I didn't have a name. You know, nobody knew who I was other than my personal network. Um, they knew who I was and I was still doing the same type of, you know, in my mind, I was still committed to the same quality of work, even though it was only being exposed to a much smaller audience for just, you know, my client and the people that were working and um, that I was working with. Um, but for years, I worked from like my dining room table and then I finally got a desk, you know, in my house. And I was like, oh, I got a desk now. I got an official studio. <laughs> and then eventually we we put up some new drywall in the bonus room over the garage you know, and it, it was always just kind of this like crappy place that was unfinished that we never went in. And it finally was like, all right, I'm going to put, we're going to get some new carpet in here. We're going to put up the drywall. I'm going to paint it. Um, of course I went in and painted the walls black as soon as I got in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then that became like my first like full on office. And I thought I had just, I was at the top of my game. I had never been doing better in my life. Um, you know, and I was, I was doing, you know, okay, freelance wise. And I think for about a year or so, I worked from that office above the garage. And then we had our third kid. So up until this two was kids, like, you were still working yeah. from the garage, right? Yeah. So like I had two kids and I was doing between the dining room table or the kitchen table, um, or even like a desk in my bedroom. I did that for several years. And then I graduated to my, uh, the bonus room over the garage. And, but even then, like it was adjoining one of my kids' bedrooms. So on conference calls, I did a, a lot of work with agencies. So I was like a contractor for a larger agency who was doing work for a larger brand. And so anytime you're doing work with like, work like that, you're always gonna have a lot more meetings, a lot more stand up, daily stand ups and all this stuff. And, um, so I'm like, a ma I got to be a master of like working the mute button in between like crying and me needing to say something on the phone. And uh, so, so after we had our third kid and we had a new infant in the house, I'm like, all right, this is, this is ridiculous. I got to get out of here and get a proper office. Like I I had, you know, every year I'm like trying to level up my rates and get better clients. And, you know, same thing that, that I can tell you've been doing over the years. Um, and at a certain point it was finally justifiable to spend four to $500 a month on some little shoebox office somewhere, uh, in Athens. And so that's what I did. I moved into a little 200 square foot little space. Um, and I had a different friend. Of mine. It was big enough for two people to work there. For a while I split the rent with him and then he went full time somewhere else. And so I was in there for a while and I was in my little shoebox office for another two or three years. And again, like, I don't think anyone even knew how I was at this point. Um, so I had a solid, this was like from 2008 till about 2013, 2014, something like that. And um, yeah, so from there, from that little shoebox office is when I went and started our first co-working space. And, you know, I could keep going, but that's, Wait, wait, wait. okay, so, so, so we'll, we'll keep going on that story because it's super interesting, but I just want to go back to the family kind of like managing while you were yeah. home with two kids before the third one arrived. How did, how did that day look like in terms of, did you add a kind of a schedule where you worked nights? Like how, what was the schedule back then? And what is the schedule right now? Like how does, how does your day look like? Yeah, I think back then 
it was still scheduled, but um, back then I had uh, I was like one of the we had like a four person team for a big client, and um, I had a daily stand up call that I needed to get on every morning at like nine. Okay. And so it might've been at 10, I can't remember, but it was like, that was like the start of my day. And sometimes I had overslept and I'm like in the bed, like, hello, you know, like trying to pretend like I've been awake for wait, several wait, wait. hours. Let me get that right. You have two kids and you overslept until nine? Or, or no, no, no. Like, well, <laughs> Is that oh, okay. So, they, so as you know, like there's never really like oversleeping. It's it probably meant I was up from like three to six in the morning. And then finally everyone fell asleep okay. at six in the morning. <laughs> and then I'm getting a few extra hours while everyone Got else is asleep. <laughs> Got it. I think, I think, and you're well aware of this, but you know, anyone with kids, I think too knows this, but you know, sleep is, is an extreme luxury. And only when you have like, the most well-behaved infant or like once they get to a certain age, I mean, even now, like just last night, like my daughter woke up at four 30 in the morning. She's been sick. And like the last couple of weeks, my other kids have been sick. Dang. I got up at like, I got up at five, not because I was on top of my game this morning, just because two of my kids were up and I was like, well, I might as well go ahead and get up. Um, so I, I think, um, I feel so like how, the craziness is, just kind of becomes the new norm. How, how old is your youngest right now? My youngest is four years old. Four years old. Okay, so you're... He'll be, he'll be, he'll be actually, he'll be five in two weeks. So he's five, like okay. pretty much five. Yeah, it's like my... Which own. is sad. It's... I feel like <laughs> I feel like the four-year-old is like their last little age of innocence. Like when they become five, it's like, now you got to really start disciplining them. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's exactly like my, my youngest is four and a half. And I have... A, no, my oldest and my youngest is uh, two years two years old right now so I, uh, yeah. okay but so so you've been is, 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 apart from them being uh sick you have been getting sleep like they're sleeping usually yeah for yeah. the most part like nowadays yeah now that my oldest is 11 and my youngest is four i mean i've had a solid decade of juggling Man. sleep deprivation yeah that's tough that's really tough <clears throat> so how does that look like how's your day looks like right now now you have more control like with the kids being a little yeah. bit older and having yeah and office. especially now now that my kids are in school um they have i had to drop them off at school at like 7 30 in the morning and my school year looks much more structured than like the summer months because a lot of times a lot of times if they are sleeping in, if the kids are not waking up super early, then I'm just like, I'm going to sleep too, because, and it's easy for me to get, it's easy for me to go much slower. And I started to feel guilty. Like my personality in general, I always feel like I need to be producing, creating, doing. Um, and, but if I, if I decide to switch it off, then I'm like full on like Netflix, video games, you know, I'm not touching a computer, like emails pile up. It's either like full on or full off usually. And um, usually during the school year, it's a lot easier to be on top of things because I have to get up to take them to school. If I want to work out, usually it's either like right before they go to school or right afterwards. And then I can just kind of stack those things in the morning. Um, for the most part, I keep my day pretty structured where I go to work after I drop the kids off. And then I try to, I try to leave my office by five or 5.30, sometimes at the latest. Every now and then I have to stay till six or later, you know, for the random thing. Um, but for the most part, nowadays, I try to keep my day pretty structured. So, you know, my wife and kids know when to expect me home. Uh, I feel like I can time box my day more. Is because the office, there's less is distraction. The office far away? Is it like a it's large about community? it's like five miles, but maybe like a 15 minute drive okay. in my car. Yeah. So it's not bad at all. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Awesome. And ha so, OK, so let's talk about the unstructured summer. It's it's funny just because I'm right now we had in israel we had kind of a almost two week passover it's like the the yeah. jewish easter where the kids had nothing so we, we had to take a week off and now we're thinking about what to do in the summer so we're like and it looks like we're gonna take off for like three weeks um yeah. which it sounds amazing like yes we're going on a three-week vacation but then like the guilt of taking off for so long is just 
yeah. and plus the cost uh, is like killing me. How do you handle kind of like the summer summer period? Yeah, so I think it's the most tricky because my wife is the one that has to like deal with the majority of that. She currently stays at home with them. And is I feel like my- Is she still working with you? Is she still working with you? Yeah, she, I mean, she still does my, she does like my, she's basically my stay at home CFO. Yeah, same here. <laughs> and um, so she, she pays all of our bills. She like- keeps she does like cash flow forecasting spreadsheets and she does our accounting um she does our basic accounting we give our taxes to an accountant at the end of the year um but she somehow done you know any actual working schedule um but now i mean all of our kids are in school so she does have from you know eight until two or so which sounds like a lot of time it actually is not that much time um, but yeah, sh she does that. And, you know, I think it, for the, for the summer, it's, it's harder because, you know, she doesn't have that time. And so it becomes more of a challenge for me really to just kind of keep her emotionally healthy in a way. Yeah, it's like, it's easy for the, it, even for me, like if I'm at home with the kids for a week, I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's a big I love my kids, but it's all, it's hard work. It's hard I mental know, work to I deal know. with ch children. Yeah. Um, even like your own children, like Dude, I, I typically was on don't. Eat. I was on a, I was on a, like a <laughs> fancy resort in Greece, and like yeah, I don't think me and my wife got to eat together because every time somebody had to run around the yeah. like catching the baby, so he doesn't drop yeah. off in the pool or something. Like, <laughs> don't throw your fork in the pool you know like yeah don't throw why are yourself. you pouring salt in your brother's drink <laughs> exactly yeah it's yeah i always it's always funny like when you say you're going to the beach or yeah we're going on vacation it's really just taking care of your kids somewhere else <laughs> yeah i still had <laughs> a blast i still had a blast but uh yeah it's it's hardcore <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a lot of work there's not like oh yeah we laid out for an hour and then we swam in the pool and then we had some drinks and then we had like a fancy dinner yeah. yeah, it's it's uh, vacation looks a little differently. Yeah. Amazing. All right, so let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about. It's weird, like because I know you. I feel like a lot of people know you, you know, on social media, but I couldn't like dig in and find like information about like your career. How did you get started and all of that? And you said you mentioned that you never had like a full time job. So how how did that start? Like, did you even go to design school or what was the process? Yeah, for you? yeah. So I. I went to design school. I've actually got a bachelor's of fine art in right. graphic design from the University of Georgia. So I went to a four-year university. Uh, I took a lot of drawing classes, a lot of like three-dimensional design classes. Like, by class. the way, I'm asking because I'm not American and I have no clue. All I know is that college is like super expensive. People are taking like more mortgages to, to get through school. Is that like how it worked for you? So in my state of Georgia, there's a scholarship called the Hope Scholarship, which is actually funded by lottery sales. All right. So people buy lottery tickets and I guess that money goes into a big bucket and there's a there's something called the Hope Scholarship. And if you maintain a B average or higher, then you qualify for the Hope Scholarship. So I actually had the Hope Scholarship all throughout college. And so I was able, you know, like if you if you don't have that, you're gonna there are different grants you can get, but, a, but again, you're going to rack up like, I mean, easily on the low end, 20 to $40,000 worth of college debt, sometimes 80, hundred, hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of college debt. So you'll, I mean, it's not uncommon for someone over here to be 40 years old. They've been out of college for 20 years and they're still, they're still like five or $10,000 that they crazy. still haven't paid off yet, That's which crazy. is insane. It's insane. Uh, and it's ridiculous. And so fortunately, I was able to somewhat escape that um, by having the hope, and not every state has it. Um, and my wife, my wife had it for most of her uh, college as well. But my parents also paid for my like housing while I was in college. Yeah. And not everyone's parents can do that, so I was definitely very privileged in that way. So you, were you able my to wife, just, like focus 100% on school and not have to worry about work and stuff like that? For the most part, I did have a weekend job where I was I was a, a professional four caddy, a certified <laughs> professional four caddy, where what I was actually that? like working on a 
<laughs> so it's like uh, a traditional like golfing caddy carries oh, okay, the okay, golfer's okay. clubs. Right, right, right. Okay. But a, a four caddy is someone that usually caddies for like a group of golfers in carts and they actually like run ahead and they calculate everyone's golf ball distance to the green and they come back and say like, oh, you got 150 yards to the green. It's a dog like left. All right. Things like that. So you're running the whole time. So I did that on the uh, weekends. That's crazy. We don't have golfing here, so it's, it's not even a thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not even a big golfer either, but I, I knew enough to get by and you could cool. make some good tips and awesome. stuff. And it was actually a good exercise for like learning how to deal with people. Some people wanted you to be really attentive to every little need. They wanted you to wipe off their club. They wanted you to do, and other people wanted you to kind of stay back. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote a dumb article once to my uh, what for that you told me next time that's great that's, that's amazing <laughs> um, that you can take away stuff from every job you know yeah yeah so i did i did that through college and i graduated with a bachelor of fine arts and graphic design and i was always much more like technically minded i was never the like the i did a lot of oil painting and i really enjoyed like just the pure visual arts um but my mom my mom was always kind of like into computers growing up and she did like some random like web development stuff with like Microsoft front page and things like that. And so I was exposed to Photoshop and things like that from, from like a very young age. And even in high school, I had a, I was one of the first kids with like a CD burner on my computer. Mm. So one of my first like businesses was getting lists of songs for people. So I would download off Napster and then I would design them a CD cover Awesome. and I would charge them 10 bucks. Uh, uh, I was like my thing. So like, I got really into designing CD covers when I was in high school. <sighs> nice. And it had like Matt's customs on the back. Like I'd, I'd like I used exact to do that. I used to do that only for girls that I dated. <laughs> only, oh, sorry, sorry. Only for my wife. I never did it for anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was, uh, that was fun times. But, but after I graduated, I was, kind of desperately just looking for a job. I was like, I need to find a job. And this guy right outside of my home or my, not my hometown, but where I was in college, he was looking for, you know, a graphic designer to do logos to maybe work on their website, just kind of like an all in house uh, kind of person that could handle a wide variety of things. And I knew how to build like basic websites with like Dreamweaver. Um, and I, and flash was really popular at the time. And I took a couple of like, uh, continuing education classes at like some local college for like learning flash development, which in retrospect were like a complete waste of time. I learned more on my own, just reading through books and experimenting. Um, but I got really, really into flash and like motion design and moving things around for no good reason and making like a bunch of like horribly awesome websites. <laughs> and that was like, I just got really excited about web design because of flash and because of, I just felt like I could be, an artist in the browser and that was kind of like my mentality for web design I was like i'm creating art and who cares about you know contrast and the user and usability like i'm an artist man i'm making like works of art here that's basically how i got started in the web and and then only through contracting through agencies was that was i like oh users okay oh, user there's, experience there's a business information here <laughs> yeah they, like somebody needs and to i was like, money here <laughs> i was i was overwhelmed by the strategy that was going into these big brand websites i'm like wow people really think this stuff through and um wait how did you get you know, to work was, with agencies yeah so one of the first agencies just kind of like contacted me out of the blue because they found a random portfolio i had posted on one of these, any random number of like portfolio websites where you can upload your work. Like I had a, a portfolio of design work on like Cargo Collective. There's another one called like Coraflot, some weird spelling. Um, there And the, almost like a old school, like Behance or what Dribble is today, things like that, where you could just upload multiple projects. And I just uploaded my best work, like school work? bunch of logos. Was that a school work? Uh, some of it was like old school work. Some of it was like client work for random freelance. Mm -hmm. projects it's probably still online i could probably find it somewhere ah that's awesome um, <laughs> i have my i have mines as well but it's hidden link you you, you yeah, can find like, it <laughs> yeah um so I, that's how i got my first foot in the door at an agency uh, in a larger city outside of my where i currently live in atlanta 
or this agency was in Atlanta and they were doing were you working lots of work for like them. Yeah. Like, I mean, I would drive up, it was like an hour drive. Okay. Um, so I drove up, met with them and they were fine. They just kind of needed a contractor to, they had a, the way their agency worked, they had a lot of like information architects or IAs as they would call them. This is like before UX was even a term. Yeah. And they were like, they had a bunch of IAs that would do wireframes and then they would hand that wireframe to a visual designer to make it look good. And that's basically what, how I started doing agency work. And the more I, the more I did that, I was like, I was like, okay, they're all, they were all using OmniGraffle for wireframes and I downloaded it and I was like, gosh, I hate this. I hate OmniGraffle. I was like, I can make wireframes in Illustrator. Like, I'm just going to start designing these in Illustrator for clients because now I'm learning how to organize things and I'm kind of learning the value of having like some low fidelity stuff up front. And so that's kind of like, I took everything I learned from age. I probably did agency work for like five years. Really? Um, from like 2009, 2008, 2009 until about. Was that just like one agency or multiple? Like, yeah, probably like half a dozen agencies, which what would happen them just randomly found you on, on the web or. No. So like the first one I was like, I was approached by one of their like recruiters. Mm hmm. And I started working there and I probably worked on five different projects at that agency, but I was always like, <clears throat> I was, rem I was one of the only remote contractors they had because a lot of other contractors would go there into the office. Um, but I was just, I would find out who the project manager was and I would always just over communicate my status. Like if I, I would never not deliver something. If I ever like was, was not delivering, then I would, give as much heads up as I could. I was just like always uh, adamant about just over delivering, over communicating. And I, I slowly developed a reputation in that organization was like, Oh, if Matt's on your project, like he's going to knock it out of the park. Like I was going to design as best I could. And you, like even better than design, I was going to like communicate with you and talk to the client, whatever you needed. Like I'm your guy. Were you, I was trying were, to just, were, were you actually talking to their clients while working on the project? Yeah. So some of the, some of the projects, not all of them, but some of them, they had like a big enough retainer and a close enough relationship where I would actually like, I used to do a lot of work for Yahoo. They had like a custom solutions department and I would go to, I would drive to Atlanta and I would go to the Yahoo headquarters and they all knew I was a contractor and I would like talk to them and, and I would, they multiple planners that would work even to the point where some of the Yahoo people were like, we want Matt designing on this project. Even though they knew it was like through the agency, they weren't going to try to hire me directly because there was, yeah, there was of course. you know, a lot of legal red tape and everything. Um, but I did that for at least a year and a half at that one agency. But then like a lot of people started leaving that agency and they started working at other agencies. Right. And right. But at, at, and then I'm basically a shoe in at another agency's project because it's like, oh yeah, Ryan was this project manager at this agency. Now he's working on this project for Home Depot and Matt, you need to just get Matt in here. So I, all of the next projects uh, at these different agencies, there wasn't even an interview. I just came in and started working because they all like, I had built up so much trust with all these other people. It was like basically name your price and there might be a little bit of negotiation but I, I already knew and I had a lot of access to like how much people were getting paid and things like that. And how did you know, idea how let's really talk ran. about that. How did you, did you have yeah, struggles so, with that? Like most people struggle with oh, that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So like when I first started uh, at this first agency, she asked me on the phone, she's like, yeah, so what's your hourly rate? And I was like, at the time, I think I was actually making about $25 an hour. And um, anytime anybody would ever ask me, I would always go at least 10 to $20 more than I was making. I'm always trying to like take that next ladder step up. And so she talked to me on the phone and she's like, what's your rate? And I'm like, I was like, yes, you know, usually I'm, I try to charge somewhere around 35 to $45 an hour. Not knowing, I had no clue, you know, what even this company was. And uh, she's like, okay, okay. So when I got there for the first like meeting, uh, it was like a madhouse. Like things were going crazy. People are running around and she's about to leave. And she's like, let me get you connected with the human resources. It was like, they just basically needed someone immediately. And there wasn't like a lot of due diligence on their part. And it was a, it was a fairly sizable company. And so she took me into the human resources like office and she was like trying to get me signed up. 
And she was like, Matt, uh, what did you, you said your rate was like, you know, um, 60 to $75 an hour. And I was like, <laughs> like time just kind of froze, froze for me. And I'm like, what, a, you know, what would you say to that? Like, and all I could think was, yes, yes, that is what I said. <laughs> and it worked. And she was, yeah. And she was like, well, you know, what, what do you want to, what do you want to settle on? And I was like, well, what do you think? Cause I mean, either of these numbers was like almost double what I was gonna charge. And she was like, well, if you can do 60, then we can give you, we can probably give you a lot more work. And I'm like, yeah, sure. That'd be fine. And so when I went in expecting like 35 to $45 an hour, they were willing to pay 60. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I am like, you know, set for life. This is amazing. You know? And again, this is back in like 2009. So any, I mean, this was like, this is really like groundbreaking for, for me and my wife. We had already been like very tight penny pinchers, like personally, like just personal finance wise, we were actively trying to pay off all of our debt and like super low living expenses, even though we had, you know, a, a kid and another one on the way. Um, and I, I always stress that to like people who are asking for like freelance advice. It's like, you really need to get your personal finances under control, like super well. Um, because I feel like the more like that's just where you mitigate most of your risk like how much do you have to pay okay so and- let me so, so let me pick your brains around that because i obviously i also s- struggle with that and i always the thing that's really hard for me is trying to think like can i lower my expenses like what's more e- what's what's easier lowering my expenses or raising my prices or the amount of hours yeah. uh, like money that i make what do you <clears throat> like how did you yeah, approach and, that? Yeah, and that, that is very, I mean, the amount of money you can make is basically infinite. That's, that's so, why it's like, it makes no sense to try to save up. I can just make more money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're starting out, I think at, at least getting it to a very reasonable level, you know, you can only cut down so much. I mean, you, you have like bills you have to pay, you got to eat, you got to wear clothes. Um, but if you're spending, you know, a thousand dollars a month on restaurants instead of $500 a month on grocery stores, then maybe that's an area you could save, you know, when you're starting out, you know, did you have like, at what point did you spread, did you like separated your bank account or I don't know if you do, but do you have a different bank account for your business versus your home? Yeah, I I have. Basically, right now I've got five bank accounts. Okay, amazing. I've that got, sounds great. <laughs> I've got uh, business, business checking, business savings, personal checking, personal savings, and then we have a separate fifth bank account for our co-working space, just to kind of keep things clean and organized. Because I, I'm basically like fifty-fifty partner with a friend of mine in that co-working space, and. And it's really, it's not because like, oh my gosh, I've got so much money. It's really just like, it's way easier to keep track of everything. So at what point did you, Um, I I just did this honestly last year and it revolutionized my understanding of what the hell is going on. And I talked to so many freelancers or even agency owners who don't do that. They just keep everything in one business account. They think it's simpler. So at what point did you do that? I got about years ago. How long? And 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. So pretty early on, you yeah. understood that like, that yeah, you need to manage that. And, and really it was like a huge, I mean, the reason I did that was really because my wife knew what to do. Like she was working, uh, she graduated with a degree in psychology, but she actually got a job as a staff accountant at this big accounting firm in town. And the CEO of the company, like basically taught her how to manage the books for a lot of his companies. And he was like, this is how you need to do it. This is, and so she basically learned from scratch from the CEO, like how to manage bookkeeping. And, and he taught her like cash flow forecasting with like spreadsheet. And she was like, I'm just going to start doing this for your business. I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. And she was, so I started um, really early uh, with, with her help. And like, I mean, she did 99% of all of this. So like huge props to her for that. Um, and and literally it does revolutionize the way you look at your money. And so like now, anytime I make a deposit, it goes directly into my checking account for my business. 
the any amount on, of tax saving take on like, just like a, a salary for yourself, like a fixed salary or. So when I first started, it was just, here's the, when I first started, it was just like money into my personal checking account. Yeah. Um, and it was basically like kind of all conflated. And then we eventually, I would put all the money in my business checking account. And then I would put those tax savings in my business savings. And then I would just pull everything into my personal checking after that, just to kind of have a paper trail of like where the income and savings and all that would go. And then maybe only like two years later, after I did that, did my wife tell me like, you know what, we should probably start like giving you a salary. And so I, I had like my official like LLC form in like 2008 or 2009 um, but it was always like sole proprietor, kind of like personal, whatever. And I think a couple of years later was when we finally were like, okay, let's start paying you a salary, a modest salary. And so we, we would just leave money in the business checking account. And then every month or every, how, however often she set it up, we would like pay ourselves from the business and do all that. And so there's it depends on where you're at especially in the states like every state has different tax laws um when i first started doing that like you could pay yourself like hey you're making you know three thousand dollars a month and then you could pay your and you would get taxed at like 25 30 percent of that uh, income tax but then you could give yourself a distribution of like twenty thousand dollars and you're only getting taxed like ten percent of that and so there are ways to like skirt around the tax law, but then they changed it. And my wife keeps up with all that. So I'm like, I know just enough to know what's going on. Okay, but so she we'll is like final, final advanced <laughs> accounting question before we move on to the next topic, do you, do, because you say you're doing cash flow forecast. Do you also do profit loss apart from, apart from cash flow? Do you know what's the difference? Do you, do you look at that? Yeah. I mean, We, we do profit loss, but I mean, like it is tricky though, because it's like, you're so tied to your business checking account. It's not like it's, you know, we have, I, we make sure that our salaries are set up to where there is typically always money to take a distribution at the end of every yeah, quarter. But, but what I mean is you want to know it's a certain point was this project more profitable than like this project I worked on, I don't know, 50 hours and it generated this much revenue while the other, uh, you know, project I spent less time and generated more revenue. So I need to understand like, you yeah. know, what's more, I don't know which activity that I'm doing, you know, and, and especially when you have a lot of them, you know, you have your side project, you have client work, you have the co-working space who like understanding, uh, do you track time and stuff like that? Yeah. So I used to track time, especially when I was working with agencies. I'm basically billing them hourly. And for some clients, I would bill hourly. But at some point, I switched to primarily like project rate or I'm billing like I'm billing someone like if it's a long project and the project and the deliverables are a little bit fuzzy, then I will bill by the week or the month sometimes. And then more often than not, I'm just billing like a, a big project rate. But if you, let, this, let's, let, let's imagine like I saw on your, on your website that you said like project starts at $20,000, which I think is great to stay up front and kind of like put away, not deal with the not relevant clients. But let's say you charge something like that don't you need to know how much time did you work to make that money? Cause like if you ended up working a year for that, then obviously it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't good. Yeah. So I should probably, I, I could, I could be better about tracking time <laughs> and knowing exactly how much, so I guess basically I don't really keep track of the hours where it's like, okay, I need to make at least 20,000 for X, amount of hours or I'm at a loss and not a profit. I mean, I, I do have um, some like milestone numbers in mind, you know, it's like 
most of the time, you know, I know like, okay, if this project is going to be this amount of money, then I don't need to work past the end of this month yeah, okay. or it's basically yeah, going to become less profitable. So I, Got it. I think of it more in terms of like Deadline, just months. So, yeah. Time wise. Or if it's like, if it's like a small, you know, cause I, I, I definitely do smaller projects too. Um, I just don't necessarily advertise that all the time. If somebody calls me and they're like, they have a, a problem that's interesting and they're local or someone like referred, referred from another project. I know I can really knock it out for them, even if it takes a day or two, but they're willing to pay, you know, a premium for that because it's a really big issue for them. Then I'll, then I'll take it on. And I know like, okay, I can probably knock this out in a couple of days, but even if it takes me a couple of weeks, then I'll be fine. So like, I don't have a strict, you know, consulting hourly like burn rate. So like, Oh, if I'm, if I'm doing this many hours, so I, I just set these like high milestones in my mind for like monthly markers, knowing that if like, I'm going to be done with this, like I'm going to give myself two months and that'll be plenty of profit for those two months uh, or three months or whatever the, you know, whatever the time frame is. And I just kind of keep track of it in my mind like that. And then my wife will put that amount of money into our income column for our cash flow forecast. And she'll tell me like, okay, if you're done with this project in July, then having that much money from that client will allow us to pay our salaries through November. Yeah. And so like, const that's constantly the conversation that we're having is like, okay, what can the business afford to pay us? Like, what is our business burn rate in a way? Uh, it's like, okay, we if, if you get that project, we can pay ourselves through the end of the year and it's only July. So, okay, that's like a really healthy amount of money to have in your business. And so, as unsophisticated as that is, that's basically how, how I'm thinking about it. Awesome. And I, I don't track hours because I just am not disciplined enough to do that. <laughs> that's Anytime I, it works. I actually have done it for a few projects where I thought I was charging much lower, but then I track every hour on a project. And I'm like, wow, I actually made like twice as much as I was planning on making just by tracking my hours. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, as you know, like even if you think something's going to take you a week to do, you might dilly dally for two or three days, and then you're like, "Oh my gosh, I got to do this!" And then you just crank it out on Thursday and Friday. But it looks like a week's worth of work, yeah. You know, and I don't think that's any less valuable. Of course, for I a don't. Client. No, no. By the way, I'm not. I'm, I'm not even talking about tracking time for somebody. Yeah, else. charging. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. no. I'm just talking about you when when you kind of like you know manage your, yourself. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Let's talk about side projects, dude. You have so much stuff going on, like from from kits, like to courses, to a bunch of stuff, like, and you've been doing that for a lot of time. So, do you want yeah. do you want to talk about what you're working on right now, or like how did you even get started creating those? Because I I saw well, that you, you know, had one like from years ago. Yeah, so actually one of the one of the very first side projects I ever initiated, and I I would be surprised if anyone even knew about this. Um, it was in 2008 or 2009. The same guy that used to share an office space with me, I convinced him to 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 help me build this like real estate application. And the reason I decided to do that is I was like real big into Flash and Flash websites and. I ended up doing a project with a landscape architect who had like stumbled across this like 360 degree like camera interactive thing and everything was done through QuickTime and it was really clunky and it was just like this crappy experience and I was like man if I could find like a flash render engine that did it I would like uh, be really into doing it and I felt like I could offer some time and I did a lot of work, like 360 photography for like commercial real estate. Even had like a, a friend of mine in Singapore, which is another crazy story, who actually did a lot of like selling and photographing. He would send me the, the photos. Anyway, long story short, this gave me the idea that oh, if I had like a an application that could host all of this stuff, even if it was like a photo slideshow um, for real estate agents, then that could be pretty cool. Like I could get like, if I get a thousand customers paying me $10 a month, like, oh my gosh, it'd be $10,000 a month. So I convinced my friend to build this application, the back end, and we created this app called Lockbox. 
and it was spelled L-O-K-B-O-K-S, kind of like the lockbox. I don't know if they have them in Israel where you the real estate agents put the little thing on the doorknob. We do not have that. So house, yeah, I know what you mean. So, from, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, we, <clears throat> this was like, we spent eight months building this thing. All right. And I never talked to... I never talked to one real estate agent while I was building it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there's a good end to this story because it's... <laughs> you already know where this is going. <laughs> I can imagine. I've been there. But so like, you know, the easiest thing to do is lock yourself in a room and build an app. Um, and and tell and like, it's the biggest secret in the world. Like, oh my gosh, I cannot tell anyone this. Like, they're going to steal they're gonna it. rip it off. Oh, of course. Yeah. They're also going to work eight months without pay. <laughs> exactly. So I'm doing this like while this is like, you know, what I'm doing in the evenings, in the mornings, like when I'm not doing client work. And so we build it and it's basically like we even made a little iPhone app. It was the first like iPhone had just came out. I designed maybe four screens for a dinky little iPhone three app. And you could take pictures of a house and you could upload it and enter in a few little pieces of information. It was like, Bada bing, bada boom, you got yourself like a slideshow for your house that you're going to list as an, as an agent. And um, we launched it to crickets chirping because we had no audience. You know, my mom was a real estate agent. She thought it was great, obviously. Did she pay $10? But, um, <laughs> I don't even think she was a paying customer. <laughs> um, and so we even, I even sponsored a conference. I had a table and I did like my pitch to a bunch of real estate agents on stage and like, I even like would like convince people at the booth to sign up. I think I got about maybe like five to six paying customers. Like two of their cards got like didn't work once it came time to like renew their plan. And we didn't have a, a way to account for that. Like, oh, I guess we should have designed a way for people to update their credit card. And, you know, that whole process was like, you know what, this this really sucks. I don't even like real estate that much. Like I started like, just, you know what? We should just pull the plug on this. This is bad. Um, but so that was like my experience first experience. You learn a lot from, Oh my gosh. Like that was, and that was 2009. That was 10 years ago. So I was like, I will never, ever, ever do that again. Um, in that way, you know, in that, in that format. And so, but one of the silver linings from that project was, uh, this was while I'm doing a bunch of agency work and one of the new agencies, this actually, this lady found me on LinkedIn, surprisingly, and they were looking for someone with mobile experience. And I guess it was kind of hard to find designers who had a lot of mobile experience in 2008, 2009, because the iPhone had just come out. And so the fact that I had a real estate application that I designed and I had like mobile screens and I did all the fancy like and it was a real uh, you know, project, not just mock-ups on, yeah. Yeah. And it was a real app and they're like, oh, you've got mobile experience? And I'm like, yes, yes, I do have mobile experience. <laughs> I designed four iPhone screens, you know. And so because of that, I th this one agency was doing like, well, they were redesigning this like AT&T U-verse mobile app. And AT&T is, you know, a huge company in the States. And they were like, yeah, we need some, we need a lead designer for all these mobile screens. And somehow some way i convinced them to like to bring me on board for that project and i was like the lead designer for all these like mobile screens having only designed this one little dinky mobile <laughs> mobile app so like that led to a lot more mobile work and even the wireframes and the designs that i did for my own app that that was like great material to pitch other clients and i got a lot more like app design work because of that and so that was like I didn't realize it, but it was like a great portfolio piece for me at the time because I I spent so much time like wireframing and designing and developing and learned a ton. Didn't have the uh, the results that I expected, but you know the intrinsic value was was way more than I could have ever imagined. And so anytime anyone approached me, we're like, "Oh, I got this software idea." I'm like, "Well, you know, here's here's the things that are going to go wrong." <laughs> And so I've been like incredibly hesitant to do anything that wasn't going to have like a direct, uh, like anything that didn't already have like a, some kind of market around it or something that I was like super passionate about. Um, like, for example, like some of the projects that you're talking about that a lot of more people might know about, like Contrast is one of the other app is really one of the only other apps um, that is like in the app store and things that people use. But 
uh, you know, me and like Sam Sophus and I developed that like in about a week. And I was like, man, I don't care if anybody uses this. Like if I have this in my menu bar, it's worth it. Yeah. Well, this, and, that's um, a little bit of different, it, like the expectations is different. You're doing it for yourself. And also, I think at that point, you already had kind of an audience, right? Yeah. I mean, at least I always feel so weird about that whole term too, like having an audience, like I guess more people followed me on Twitter <laughs> at that point than they did when I was building a real estate application app. Like, I don't even know if I had a Twitter account at that point. Um, but you're right. I mean, I had but like, by the way, it's not just, like, it's not, <laughs> you didn't have real estate agents following you on, on Twitter, <laughs> correct. which yeah, is, exactly. which is like, like the audience for that particular product. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So like if I was, You know, I, I definitely think like I knew for a fact, like I know at least I personally know probably a hundred designers that would really like to use an app like this. Um, you know, and same thing for like, like FlowKit, like I was feeling this pain and I knew like, I would have been like, hey, what do you use your flow and sketch or whatever. And, you know, hearing a lot of the same thing and just like experiencing the pain, I'm like, you know what, I know that if, if I make this, Um, and actually, actually flow kit, I made it for a client project. I was like getting paid for a project when I made that whole thing. And I was like, I could probably turn this into a little product. And, um, that was like, that was kind of crazy. Like I'm still kind of blown away by how many people have responded well to the flow kit project. Um, so were there was, so were yeah. there was in terms of, uh, let's call this business success where there was more successful in terms of, you know, Oh yeah. Like, well, lockbox made zero money. Yeah. No, not zero. You had five, five like $50. Uh, well, <laughs> if you, if you like tally up the time spent and do a true profit and loss statement, that was like a true loss. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean like contrast, um, I mean, gosh, I could probably pull up like Sam, Sam, like Sam sofas has his like developer account for, uh, for contrast but I'm, I can literally like pull up the figures for contrast. I think we launched it and maybe let's see if I can, this might be, uh, let's see all time. looks like we launched it in July of 2017. That's basically two years ago. The app itself has made $25,747. Amazing. Incredible. And, um, is that, what are you looking at? Uh, is this iTunes or, uh, that, that's Stripe? like the iTunes account. Stripe, okay. I don't, Yeah, it's iTunes. It's like an app called App Figures. Yeah. And I don't, I think this is after Apple's cut too. Right. And so Sam and I, you know, just split the income every like six months or so, which again, like that's not a crazy amount of money over like three years or two, two for, years rather. But still, I mean, like, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and and Flowkit, Flowkit has continually like produced revenue every week. Um, it's not enough to live off of, but it's still like, Oh, Hey, there's like thousand dollars in the PayPal account now that I didn't expect to be in there. Um, and PayPal is kind of dangerous because you don't really track it as well as like a regular <laughs> <laughs> income. Um, and then the, what, the what only about, other thing, I, what about you? I, I'll stop talking. I'll let you answer. Some, no, <laughs> some no, no. <laughs> what about the, the course that you like the, I think it was called the AI UX course that you did yeah. was that the first course that you did yeah that was the first course that i did so i was that was back in i believe that was the like late 2015 is when i released that and i i definitely did a, i i didn't know what to expect i didn't really have even in 2015 i don't think i didn't really have like a huge following like I, I came up with like the float label thing in like 2013 and I had a little bit of like interest and in people like who yeah. were excited about that for like the last year. But it wasn't story. like a story. We can talk about this later. It's like, Oh, I came up with the, with the flow, float label thing. Yeah. That Google uses. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Just <laughs> but again, it was just like a little, it was, it was literally like one screen app that I was like just fiddling with some animations on and it became, it just kind of took on a life of its own. It wasn't like I planned to like, Was that a side project? Field. Was that just like something yeah, cool so to do for this, Dribbble? So just, let's, just, let's just give context for people who don't know the story. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So in 2013, I was actually on a plane from Circles Conference back to the back to Atlanta. Um, my friend Ish Bersiag. I don't know if you've ever been to Circles or not, or, no. or heard of that, but it's a great conference in uh, in Texas. And um, I was on the way back, and I was real pumped up about you know side projects and you know feeling very motivated after the conference. And the same friend, the same developer friend that I had convinced to build Lockbox with me back in 2008. Well, fast forward like five years into the future, I convinced the same guy, hey, we need to build an app for posting things for sale on Craigslist. <laughs> and this was, this was like before Facebook Marketplace and things like that. Because if you, if you, I don't know if Craigslist even exists in Israel or not. Do people use Craigslist in I know, Israel? Not really. Okay, okay, but you've heard of it. You're yeah, kind of, of course, aware of it. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. And so Craigslist is like the most clunky, yeah, non-design it, it, It's very experienced for that, yeah. And so we were going to build this like very hacky, like screen scraping app to just process into like a screen process with the keyboard showing. And that was like my design constraint. And I was really motivated, and and so I was like, "How am I gonna like save space on the screen? Like the labels are in the way; it's pushing all the content really far down." I was like, "What if I hide the labels, and and then only when you start typing, then they kind of pop up and they're really small. That'll save me a little bit of space. That way, the keyboard can always be showing, and I can. And again, this is like iPhone four or something, so we had a lot less room. And I really think it was just because I I had created this almost in a way, like an unrealistic constraint to design in. I just had to get really creative where, where, where was everything going to go? I guess some things are going to have to be hidden and just start showing when you start typing. And so I animated everything in a, in flash, uh, which no longer exists today. It, you know, the open of life level. And, um, because I had all this experience from my flash days long, you know, many years before. And I'm like, all right, I'm just going to post. I exported the Flash movie, imported it into Photoshop, converted it to a GIF, exported it, you know, as a GIF, animated GIF onto Dribble, and um, just posted it. And it just kind of blew up. Like in it, uh, this iOS developer in New York named Jared Verdi pretty quickly like built an iOS version of that thing, and he he's the one that called it the floating label pattern. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good name. And so someone found his post and then he credited the design and then like CSS tricks picked it up. Brad Frost tw blogged about it and it just kind of like exploded. Like it's kind of like everybody's talking about the float label pattern. And then pretty like a year later, Google released material design guidelines and their standard was like the floating label. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. And so this like, is incredible. if you look at the original, I actually bought the domain floatlabel.com, which redirects to that post. And, uh, and I was actually trying to sell a laptop bag. It was like a vintage military grade, whatever. And so like their example on the material guidelines still has like the same title that I was using for the, the like dribble shot. So that was amazing. kind of fun. Oh, and, and again, it was just like some random thing that just kind of picked up steam. I didn't, that wasn't like a... So that that first initial viral type of thing, like brought in uh, a bunch of followers, I guess, on Twitter or on Dribbble. Yeah, like, yeah, I was a lot more, I, I was a lot more exposed, like with air quotes around that. Uh, and a lot more people started, you know, following me because of that. And even... You know, I had a couple of projects where like, oh, you're the guy that came up with the float label. Oh, I love that. And um, so like that was definitely like a big boost, if you will, like in terms of just people knowing about me online. Um, so and, back to the, back so yeah, to the course. It, yeah. So two years later is when I was like, all right, I'm going to try to release a course. I was still really into using Illustrator for wireframing and I was just getting into using sketch for UI design, but it was still really hard to like draw lines and sketch was never like a great, if, if you've ever been like a power Adobe Illustrator user, trying to manipulate vector lines inside yeah. of sketch is just really difficult. And, and even, even Figma in a lot of ways, like sometimes it, 
like just the way that Adobe handles vector sometimes can be a little bit more like free flowing. And so I used to do all my wireframing, all my UX design flows, everything was done in illustrator. And, um, at some point I put together this little like wireframing kit where it was like, here's all the wireframes in illustrator and here's like a presentation document in InDesign. And I decided to sell that on Gumroad for like 10 bucks. And this was probably close to like right after the flow kit thing. And, and to my surprise, I'm, I sold like a hundred of those like in a year. And I was like, Hey, I made a thousand dollars off this thing. And that was just enough of a taste of like product and like selling something online where I was just like, Oh, I wonder if I could do this at a bigger scale. So I was like, I'm going to teach everybody how to do my illustrator wireframing process. I'm not going to do any research. I'm just going to tell everybody how to do it. I'm going to charge for it. <laughs> I love it that you learned from your original mistake. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I think I justified like, well, people want to learn about this because they're buying this kit. Of course. You know, like yeah, that was enough. Actually that right. was a, yeah, this you is, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. This is, this is truly was, validated. Right. And, and, you know, like you could totally poke holes in my, my hypothesis about validation no, for also, sure. Also, you have a hundred customers who already bought from you and you can pitch them. Yeah. So, so I was like, you know what, there's people who are using Illustrator that don't want to use OmniGraffle. There's people like me that, that are familiar with Adobe and I'm going to teach my techniques for like responsive web design, wireframing in Adobe Illustrator. And so I just got to it, just started recording. Uh, um, and of course, like being the stubborn designer that I am, I convinced another developer friend of mine to like build out a custom backend for the course platform. And instead of just using an off the shelf thing, I was like, oh, it's got to be like way, completely they, custom. Back, back in the day, I don't know if there were a lot of off the shelf. Like today, there are many, but back yeah, in the time. Yeah, I think, I think um, Teachable existed, but it was like a different name. I okay. think it was, it was some other weird name. I think they okay. rebranded. Mm -hmm. Um, and like Kajabi was like just coming out and there were great alternatives. So I was like, I really just need some kind of paywall. So we built just enough of an application to kind of make that happen. And, um, I was like, you know, spent like a month on the sales page and like just went down this like internet marketing wormhole. Dude, I, ever, I wanted to say that I, mean, I was impressed by it. I mean, like, you know, I have a sales page myself, so I know that you've deployed many of the good tactics and you did a really exactly. good job there. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I spent, for one, I spent almost as much time like developing the course platform as I did developing the course and almost the same amount of time like writing and developing the sales page and gathering testimonials and just doing the whole like due diligence on the sales process and everything like that. And, you know, stayed up all night the night before, like at the launch. I think I launched it on like December 5th, which just sounded like the worst time to launch ever. Um, and, but it was like, you know what, it's ready. I'm just pushing it out. I don't, I don't care. And um, man, I, I was just like holding my breath until the first sale came in. And like, you know, it was an expensive course. I was charging either six monthly payments of $99 or save $100 and buy it for a one-time fee of $494. Because it was like 12 hours of content. You know, it was a big, big, big hefty course. Do not, do not justify your price, Matt. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, you know, like when you're pricing things, you're like, oh, I need, I mean, honestly, <laughs> You could charge that much money for an hour long what course you, at the value. Of exactly. It's, it's like you, you just said, I mean? you just told me that the course is worth the money because it's 12 hours of video. And it's like, yes, my logo is worth $10,000 because I put 12 hours in it. It's not, it's yeah, got nothing to do. I know. I know. But you know, like that's just my like self doubt. Uh, my insecurity is bleeding out into the microphone. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I just wanted to point Which this I'm, out because I'm, everybody has that. I had that as well. Oh yeah. And I think and, everybody's and trying to sell feels that yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, and even though I have multiple things for sale online, it, you, that really never goes away. I mean, maybe it softens a little bit, like you're not, yeah, I'm, whatever, I'm gonna charge a thousand dollars for this, it'll be fine. Um, yeah, but like, you definitely have to beat that mindset down with a stick because it, it, it can like consume you. Um, but that course, uh, I think I made, 
uh, probably anywhere from like 20, maybe like 15 to $20,000 in the first month of that course, which Incredible. was like blew my mind. Wow. I was like, Oh my gosh. And I also like, like you said, I leveraged the crap out of like all of my contacts. Like I hit up every Slack channel. I got everybody to review it. Anybody who was anybody I was like, Hey man, can you check out this course? Maybe if you think it's cool, like give me a blurb about it. Um, I mean, I did like some serious, like, user kind of like feedback i did like a beta test group and redid some things like i did a lot of work on it to try to get it ready to sell and um for the following year um i think it i think over the course of a year i mean i think it accounted for about a third of my income wow amazing uh, for the for the following year and the problem with that course though is i ultimately started ditching illustrator in favor of like doing everything inside a sketch I was like, you know what? This is too much work. I'm doing double the amount of work. And um, I started to really, really enjoy using Sketch. And so it was like really difficult to do any content marketing. I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. And right. and so I I ended up setting up like a another dumb thing I did was I over-optimized my like automated sales funnel, lead magnet, automated launch to the people close open. What do you mean, like, do you mean over-optimized? So I didn't have enough traffic to justify the amount of automation I was trying to build. Okay. With like, okay, yeah, yeah. With like because the course was closed and I would open it and you had like two weeks to sign up for it and then I would close it again. But I, me and this developer friend of mine, we set up these things in our app called launch tokens. And so if you signed up for this lead magnet and then you, you, any, if you got through the, the like five free emails and then you expressed interest by clicking a button, that would activate a launch token in our app, which also coincided with the next five days worth of sales emails. And, and it would pass your email through the URL and it would open the course just for your email. Yeah, wow. URL. And it was super you got complicated. Five. And it was, it was super complicated. And I had like 10 visitors, <laughs> you know, it was stupid. I spent so I spent like three months building that, and Dude. it was like, okay, I'm actually running out of cash. I need to do client work now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just got too, you know, I got too blinded by the idea of earning product income, and I wasn't even that excited about the the content anymore. Not because I didn't think it was still valuable, but it was like I'm not going to market this because I don't even, you know, technically work this way anymore. Like I still do this type like the design process is really unchanged, but the software has changed a lot. And, you know, it'd be like if you stopped using Webflow. Exactly. Yeah. And you started doing like, oh, I love Squarespace. Now I'm Squarespace, Squarespace, Squarespace. <laughs> but you got oh, this that, Webflow that's course. Totally, that's really <laughs> likely to happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and, yeah, and I, I think totally it's, get it. but yeah. you understand, yeah, you know, like course, there, there is a certain but, risk to like but then, everything up into a software. Yeah. But then the question is, why didn't you not, not update the content or, or that's basically what you're doing right now? Yeah. So like three years later, um, I think I just got, I think I hit like a very, I think after that, after I spent too much time on that and it wasn't monitoring my like runway and my business in terms of like how much cash we had on hand, I just hit like a kind of a scary point where I was like, oh my gosh, like if I don't invoice someone immediately, like I'm going to start like not being able to pay for things. And so were, were you not, I ended taking, up, were you not taking clients at the time? Were you, yeah, I was like turning people down. Them. Yeah. I, I took on a couple clients, but then I actively like turned people away for like three months. Um, and I was expecting to have this like big revival of product sales because I created this, such a cool optimization strategy. For product. I wasn't really, I wasn't focused on just creating a simple product that I deeply understood. You know, it was like this crazy thing that I barely knew how it worked and there's no traffic. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so I just kind of decided that year, I was like, you know what, I'm going to really focus on just doing a ton of client work building back up like a very comfortable amount of like savings in the business. And, you know, when you really, really like whatever you're really focused on, that's kind of what you're going to attract. At least that's been my experience. Like if you're just really focused on 
mobile apps and designing mobile apps and you're posting mobile app org to dribble like people are going to ask you about designing mobile apps and you're going to you're going to find more opportunities based on what you're focusing on and and so i just i had a couple of really big projects over the next couple of years that that turned up as a result of that and i did smaller things like i made a little course called intro to icons um I actually did like an Adobe Max presentation and I turned that into a, like a free video course. Um, Cause I was actually planning on, I was like, I'm gonna create like a free course as like a big lead generator. And then I'm, I'll create like a premium version of that later. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I did like a survey to my email list and like no one was really interested in like a big paid interface icon course. And I was like, oh crap, that's what I was planning <laughs> on doing and nobody's interested in it. So at this point, so, you know to survey your audience before. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and a lot of How's people that, by, were, by the way, how big's your email list? It's interesting. I've, I had it, it was close to like maybe 15 or 16,000 people. And then like, I did like some of those, like you can segment it by yeah, last if you never people open email. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think I had like maybe 3000 people that were like inactive enough to where it was like, okay, I should probably not have these people on my list anymore. So I, I've pruned it down. I think I'm probably like 10 or 12,000, something like that. No, but that's awesome. That's one of the things that I never do. And I never did that. And, uh, no, I, it's not completely accurate because I had the new school, which has an e- had an email list, but uh, I personally like did not do that up until now. Um, so that's, yeah, that's yeah, really it, valuable to have. Yeah, I think it's, it's great. And I don't maintain it as well as I should. Like I had, I've had lots of plans over the years to like, I'm going to send out an email every week. I'm going to be teaching stuff every week. I'm going to make a YouTube video every week. I'm going to email people, you know, and like, I just, I definitely know, like, I need to be more consistent with at least one thing. Um, and I, by the way, I'm like, always blown away by you just like constantly posting like videos. Like, I feel like it's just clockwork. Like now it's just like, you probably don't even think about it. It's like, yeah, it is my video. by the way. Yeah. It just, it just, you know, it's like, yeah, this is what I'm doing today. It's done. And I move on. Like it's exactly once you just, you incorporate it into your, into your routine. It's not really that big of a deal, but then I'll overthink it forever. It's like, Oh, I got to send, you know, I'm going to go from nothing to sending an email every week. I'm going to post a video every day. I'm going to do like Instagram on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm going to do a dribble on Tuesday and Thursday. And it's like, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm just not going to do anything. You you say that, but honestly, you're active on all platforms. I'm not even active on all platforms. I was only active on YouTube and then recently just started like getting into Instagram. But you're, you you have your dribble, you have your Twitter, you have, you know, uh, YouTube, um, so you do manage to maintain, even if it's not on a regular base, you're much more diverse, I would say, on your platforms. I mean, I could somewhat agree with that. I mean, I try to, I enjoy like just, I think I, it's natural for me to be on Twitter because um, I, I started off on Twitter. That was like my first social network. That was basically like, I mean, that's how I met just about every internet friend that I know. Like, I think I eventually, I think I probably saw one of your YouTube videos maybe before I saw one of your tweets, but I think it was probably because of someone else I followed on Twitter because I ever, you know, like I met Dan Petty through Twitter and then through Dribble, And we had a friendship for probably three or four years before he ever stopped, before he ever started Evercurrents. And, um, you know, so I, Twitter has always just been like kind of my go-to thing since like 2007 or eight. And um, so I definitely do try to like switch it up, but I do, I do wish that I was more consistent with like regularly scheduled content, even if it was like one video, one new a week or one blog post a week. I think I just, I would always try to bite off too much. Um, and, and now I'm just like, I'll just do it sporadically. I, I really just, even last year, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to say no to trying to do something crazy. And I'm just going to focus on building products. And then once I have enough products in my repertoire, then I will focus on publishing regularly. Cause you know, I think, and you could probably speak to this as well. Like it's probably much easier to like 
do a webinar or post a video about Webflow. Like it, it just makes more business sense for you to do that on a regular basis now that you have a course to, to sell as well. Yeah. But at the same time, you're also doing that before you had that course as well. So, yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting to hear like, what is your motivation or what was your motivation, you know, to, to stick with YouTube, you know, so regularly, even for, for you know, courses and things. It was just like, I enjoyed doing this. I always enjoyed kind of like making content. I used to have a blog before that. And when I discovered video, started my YouTube kind of as an experiment. You know, I was inspired by all the Casey vlogs and stuff and it started out as a vlog. Yeah. Um, but I literally discovered that I enjoy the format, like talking to the camera and it just came natural to me in the editing and stuff. It was just so fun that I kept doing it. Um, right. And I still get energy from doing it. Um, so that's, that's why I started. It wasn't like three years in, I think, before I had kind of a product. Um, and right. even that actually came up as a kind of a side project that now took over just because it worked well. Um, but it, right. I, I wasn't planning this. It wasn't like I was, I'm going to have a lot of audience and then I'm going to sell them. Some, uh, it just happened. Yeah, exactly. Uh, to, to, be, to be perfectly honest, I think a lot of people were asking me to teach stuff and I right. tried to avoid that just because right. of a personal issue type of thing. Like I don't want to be the guru that teaches people. That's not me. I want to create, yeah. like I want to create an app. I want to, I want to be a SaaS yeah. business. Yo, that's, that's, I'll yeah, be a yeah. product designer and I'll design amazing product. Uh, and I did that and yeah. it failed. Um, and then I just add, do what people wanted me to do and it worked. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's, it's hard, to, you know, it's, it, I feel like at a certain point, you know, like if you grow an audience with your YouTube channel and Instagram, whatever, and like, you've got literally hundreds of people being like, man, I want to hear you teach about Webflow. Like, can you please do a course on Webflow? Like I'm ready. Like the money is burning a hole in my pocket. Like I need you to teach it. It's like, Hmm, what should I work uh, on right now? Yeah. Like, I guess I'm going to do a course on what? Yeah. And so I, I feel like I have gotten, um, so I, I think because of like, because of my course in 2015 and because of my, like my software in 2008 or nine, um, I've, I've like taken a slower approach to like creating my next big course because I wanted to make sure that this is something that's like, very much like desired and yeah. also something that I could yeah. see myself like really promoting and really getting behind. And, um, so like I, I did, uh, I think I did like a very serious like survey to my email list last fall. And, um, I kept, I kept wanting to do it the course, but I was like, I kept getting backed up with projects. Um, and, I didn't really mean to. I was like, oh, I could probably finish this project. And then I'll, I was actually wanting to release my next course last fall. And then I was like, okay, well, I can push it till January. And then, oh, I can push it to February. And then we bought this like new house and we're renovating it. And I ended up like designing the entire thing. And this has been like another full-time project. And I'm like, okay, maybe if I can launch it in June, it'd be fine. And then I picked up another client project because, you know, I just, you know, needed to. <laughs> and it's like, okay, maybe if, if I could launch in July or August, that'd be pretty good. But now it's like, I've got like, but I've constantly been talking to people, constantly been sharing. Uh, a lot of this content has been in some of my workshops and a lot of this same stuff people like ask me about all the time. And I, I, I still have people pretty regularly either emailing me or hitting me up on like Instagram direct message. I mean like, Hey, when's your course coming out? I'm like, saving up for this course. I can't wait to, you know, for your new course. And so I guess basically like after emailing everyone and like constantly like thinking about it and trying to figure out the best structure, I wanted to make my new course on like specifically on interface design. And, but I, I kind of didn't want it to be tied up into like sketch or, or even Figma or Framer or illustrator because that kind of burnt me, burnt me in the past. Right. And, and as a matter of fact, like, I use Sketch on a project. I'll use Framer. Uh, I actually don't use Framer that much, but I'm trying to learn it for a project now. Um, but I really enjoy Figma, and like sometimes I still bust open Illustrator or Photoshop. And so I've really tried to spend the last couple of months like 
writing about like design concepts and like typography, layout, color, style, and like kind of cataloging my entire design process <clears throat> from like setting expectations, deliverables, here's how I start my designs, here's like how I present my designs, you know, and, and walk someone through the entire design process regardless of software, but, but also using software at the same time. Um, and so like the new course, just go um, you can sign up for the email at shipnudge.com to get notified when it's released, but I don't, I haven't really set a release date, although I'm really trying to make it happen like this summer. <laughs> um, do you have structured time or is it just like when I don't have a bunch of client work, I'll, I'll find some time for that. I, I did have structured time until I, I have about like, I'd say 15% of the course recorded already. Um, but then I, I just got this really big project um, that's going to take me a couple of months. And uh, this has taken like big priority over my my schedule. And then also like we're going to be moving in the next, like literally the next week. So we've been packing up. We were trying to sell our house, doing work on the old house, doing work on the new house. And like, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to have to push the pause button for a little bit longer. But I have the entire outline like written. I've got a content like ready to go and i've got you know i feel like i could if i had like two full weeks to just record everything i could probably make it happen i even have a friend in my co-working space that uh does like video editing like full time and he's like kind of on board to help me out edit everything so it's everything's lined up it's just a matter of like sitting down and recording everything because it, it is a i i'm trying to make it as short of a course as possible but it's still a really big lengthy course to cover everything that I want to cover because in my mind, this is going to be like literally everything I know about the design, dealing with a design process with a new client or an existing client from start to finish, handing off to developers, prototyping, animating, and then all of the like the principles of design that goes into all of that. So it's, it's kind of a, it's become larger than I really wanted it to be, but I feel like to, to really give someone everything that they would need to be able to do this you know it is what it is <laughs> awesome dude i uh we, we have to we have to close because i gotta, gotta go pick up the kids as well <laughs> but uh <laughs> there's so much more i wanted to cover like you renovating your new house right now which is like oh, you learned that like how to use the, the the interior design software and so much stuff i wanted to cover but Dude, it's been so good to catch up. So I think maybe at a later point, uh, maybe we'll, gonna, uh, we'll do a follow-up yeah, next we'll week. Here we go, round two. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. When, when when your course is about ready, I think it'll be a good time to to talk about that. Yeah, and, for sure. And, and the other things. Uh, so thank you so much for coming. I think mean, it was an amazing conversation. Uh, oh man, it's been all I, I, anytime, Ran. You know, like we need to get together more often. For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. All right, Matt. Have an awesome day. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.